all for today's episode of Ruffles, Ernest Hornang's classic tale of the cricketer turned cracksman. Robert Stevens, as Raffles' faithful biographer and partner in crime, Bunny, tells us a little more about the secret past of that gentleman burglar. Right after his success with Lady Melrose's diamonds at Milchester Abbey, Raffles told me the story of his earliest crime. Not since that fateful morning on the Ides of March, when I had become embroiled in the life of crime, and he had mentioned his first step in as an unreported incident of a certain cricket tour, had I succeeded in getting a word out of him on the subject. Raffles would plan a fresh enormity or glory in the last with unmitigated enthusiasm of the artist. It was impossible to imagine one throb or twitter of compunction beneath those frankly egotistic and infectious transports. And yet the ghost of a dead remorse seemed still to visit him with the memory of his first felony, so that I had given up the story long before the night of our return from Milchester. Cricket, however, was in the air, and Raffles' cricket bag, back where he sometimes kept it, in the fender, with the remains of an orient label still adhering to the leather. And my eyes had been on this label for some time, and I suppose his eyes had been on mine. For all at once, he asked me if I still burned to hear the yarn. It's no use, I replied, you won't spin it, so I must imagine it for myself. How can you, he asked. Oh, I smiled. I begin to know your methods. Will you take it? I went in with my eyes open, as I do now, eh? He said. I can't imagine you doing otherwise, I responded. His chair wheeled back into the books as he sprang up with sudden energy. There was quite an indignant glitter in his eyes. My dear Bunny, he cried. It was the most unpremeditated thing I ever did in my life. I can't believe that, I said craftily. I can't pay you such a poor compliment. Then you must be a fool. He broke off, stared hard at me, and in a trice stood smiling in spite of himself. Or a better knave than I thought you, Bunny. Well, I suppose I am fairly drawn. As a matter of fact, I've been thinking of the thing. Last night's racket reminds me of it in one or two respects. I'll tell you what, though. This is an occasion in any case, and I'm going to celebrate it by breaking the one good rule of my life, and I'm going to have a second drink. The whiskey tinkled, the siphon fizzed, the ice plopped home. And sitting there in his pajamas with the inevitable cigarette, Raffles told me the story that I had given up hoping to hear. The windows were wide open and the sounds of the Piccadilly floated in as Raffles began his tale. I had started in a hole. I ought really to have refused the invitation to play in Australia, but I didn't. Then we all went to Melbourne races and I had the certain winner that didn't win. And that's not the only way you can play the fool in Melbourne. I wasn't the steady old stager I am now, Barry. The others didn't know how hard up I was, and I swore they shouldn't. I tried the moneylenders, but they're extra fly out there. Then I thought of a kinsman of sorts, a second cousin of my father's, whom none of us knew anything about except that he was supposed to be in one or other of the colonies. If he was a rich man, well and good. I could work him. If not, there would be no harm done. I tried to get on his tracks, and as luck would have it, I succeeded, or thought I had it, at the very moment when I happened to have a few days to myself. I was cut on the hand just before the big Christmas match, and couldn't have bowled a ball if they'd paid me. A surgeon who fixed me up happened to ask me if I was in a relation of raffles of the National Bank, and the pure luck of it almost took my breath away. A relation who was a high official in one of the banks, who would finance me on my mere name. Could anything be better? 
I had made up my mind that this Raffles was the man I wanted and was awfully sold to find next moment that he wasn't a high official at all, nor had the doctor so much as met him, but he'd merely read of him in connection with a small sensation at a suburban branch, which my namesake managed. An armed robber had been rather pluckily beaten off with a bullet in him by this Raffles. But that sort of thing was so common out there that this was the first I'd heard of it. A suburban branch, my financier, had faded into some excellent fellow with a billet to lose and he called his soul his own. Still a manager was a manager, and I said I would see whether this was the relative I was looking for, if he would be good enough to give me the name of the branch. I'll do more, says the doctor. I'll get you the name of the branch he's been promoted to, for I think I heard they'd moved him up already. The next day he brought me the name of the township Yay some fifty miles north of Melbourne. But with the vagueness which characterised all his information, he was unable to say whether I should find my relative there or not. He's a single man, and his initials are W.F., said the doctor, who was sure enough of all the material points. He left his old post several days ago, but it appears he's not due at the new one till the new year, but no doubt he'll go there before then to take things over and settle in. You might find him up there, and you might not. If I were you, I would write. But that'll lose two days, I said. The more would be even there. You see, I'd grown quite keen on this upcountry manager, and I felt that if I could get at him while the holidays were still on, a little conviviality might help matters considerably. Then, said the doctor, I should get a quiet horse and ride. You needn't use that hand. Can't I go betray, I asked. Well, you can, and you can't he said. He would still have to ride, so he might as well ride all the way. It's a delightful road through Whittlesea and over the plenty rages. It'll give you some idea of the bush, Mr. Raffles, and you'll see the source of the water supply of this city. You'll see where every drop of it comes from, the pure yin-yang. I wish I had the time to ride with you, but um, where can I get a horse? The doctor thought for a moment, well, I'm a mare of my own. It's as fat as butter for want of work, he said. It would be a charity to me for you to sit on my back for a hundred miles or so, and then I should know you'd have no temptation to use that hand. You're far too good, I protested. You're A.J. Raffles, he said, and if ever there was a prettier compliment or a finer instance of even colonial hospitality, I can only say, Bunny, that I have never heard of either. Well... I managed to write a line to W.F. with my own hand, and next morning the doctor packed me off on a bovine beast that would have done for an ambulance. Half the team came up to see me start, and the others were rather sick with me for not stopping to see the match, as if I could help them win by watching them. They little knew the game I'd got on myself, but still less did I know the game I was going to play. It was an interesting enough ride. The first thirty miles or so was a good metal road, but after Whittlesea, it was a mere track over range of a track I often couldn't see, and left entirely to the mare. Now it dipped into a gully and ran through a creek, and all the time the local colour was inches thick. Gum trees galore and parrots, all colours of the rainbow. In one place, a whole forest of gums had been ring-marked and were just as though they had been painted white without a leaf or a living thing for miles. And the first living thing I did meet was a sort to give you the creeps. It was a riderless horse coming full tilt through the bush with the saddle twisted round and the stirrup irons ringing. Without thinking, I had a shot at heading him off with the doctor's mare and blocked him just enough to allow a man who had come galloping after to do the rest. Thank you, mister growled the man, a huge chap in a red checked shirt with a beard like W.G. Grace, but the very devil of an expression. Been an accident, I asked, reining up. Yeah, he said, scowling as we defied me to ask any more. And a nasty one, I said, if that's blood on the saddle. Well, Bunny, I may be a blackguard myself, but I don't think I ever looked the fellow as that chap looked at me. But I stirred him out and forced him to admit that it was blood on the twisted saddle. 
He said a mate of his had been dragged under a branch and had his nose smashed. But that was all. He had sat tight there after it till he dropped from loss of blood. And another mate was with him back in the bush. Well, as I've said already, I wasn't the old stager I am now in any respect. And we parted good enough, friends. He asked me which way I was going. And when I told him, he said, I should save seven miles and get to Ye a good hour earlier by striking off the track and making for a peak that we could see through the trees and following a creek that I should see from the peak. Don't smile, Bunny. I began by saying I was a child in those days. Of course, of course, the shortcut was the long way round. And it was nearly dark when that unlucky mare and I saw the single street of Ye. I was looking for the bank when a fellow in a white suit ran down from the veranda. Mr. Raffles, he said. Mr. Raffles, I said, laughing as I shook my head. You are late, he said. I was misdirected, I told him. Oh, that's all. I am relieved, he said. Do you know what they're saying? There are some brand new bush rangers on the road between Whittlesea and here. A second killie gang. Still... They'd have caught a tartar in you, eh? Well, they certainly would in you, I retorted. But this remark shut him up and seemed to puzzle him. But there was much more point in me saying it to him, who had shot a potential bank robber, than in him saying it to me. I'm afraid you'll find things pretty rough, he went on, when he had unstrapped my valise and handed my reins to his man. It's lucky you're a bachelor like myself. I could not quite see the point of this remark either, since... Had I been married, I would have hardly sprung my wife on him in this free and easy fashion. I muttered the conventional sort of thing. And then he said I should find it all right when I'd settled in. As I'd come to graze with him for weeks. Well, I thought, these colonials do take the cake for hospitality. And still marvelling, I let him lead me into the private part of the bank. Now, dinner will be ready in a quarter of an hour, he said as we entered. I thought you might like a tub first. And you'll find all ready in your room at the end of the passage. Sing out if there's anything you want. Your luggage hasn't turned up yet, by the way. But there's a letter that came this morning. Not for me, I said. Yeah, he answered. Didn't you expect one? I, I certainly did not, I told him. Well, here it is. And he handed me an envelope, which... As he led me to my room, I realised was very familiar, for I read on it my own superscription of the previous day. To W. F. Raffles. Bunny, you've had your wind bag at foot, I dare say, so you know what it's like. All I can say is that my moral wind was bagged by that letter, as I hope. Old chap, I have never yet bagged yours. I couldn't speak. I could only stand with my own letter in my hands until he had the good taste to leave me by myself. W. F. Raffles. We had mistaken each other for W. F. Raffles, for the new manager, who had not yet arrived. Small wonder that we had conversed across purposes. The only wonder was that we had not discovered our mutual mistake. How the other man would have laughed. But I, I, I could not laugh. I Jove, no, it was no laughing matter for me. I saw the whole thing in a flash, without a tremor, but with the direst depression from my own single point of view. Call it callous if you like, Bunny, but remember that I was in much the same hole as you'd since been in yourself, and that I had counted on this W.F. raffle, even as you counted on yours truly, A.J. I thought of the man with the W.G. beard, the riderless horse, the bloody saddle, the deliberate misdirection that had put me off my track and out of the way, and now, the missing manager and the report of bush rangers at this end. But I simply don't pretend to have felt any personal pity for a man whom I had never seen. That kind of pity is usually camped. And besides, all of mine was needed for myself. I was in as big a hole as ever. What the devil was I to do? I doubt if I have sufficiently impressed upon you the absolute necessity of my returning to Melbourne in funds. As a matter of fact, it was less the necessity than my own determination, which I can truthfully ascribe as absolute. Money I would have, but how? But how would this stranger be open to persuasion if I told him the truth? Now, 
That would set all of us scouring the country for the rest of the night. Why should I tell him? Suppose I left him to find out his mistake. Would anything be gained? Barney, I give you my word that I went into dinner without a definite intention in my head or one premeditated lie upon my lips. I might do the decent, natural thing and explain matters without the loss of time. On the other hand, there was no hurry. I had not opened the letter. One could always pretend that I had not noticed the initials. Meanwhile, something might turn up. I could wait a little and see. Tempted I was already, but as yet the temptation was vague, and in his very vagueness made me tremble. Bad news, I'm afraid, said the manager when I at last sat down at the table. No, a mere annoyance, I answered. I do assure you, on the spur of the moment and nothing else. My lie was told, my position was taken. From that moment onward, there was no retreat. By implication, without realising what I was doing, I had already declared myself W.F. Raffles. Therefore, W.F. Raffles I would be in that bank for that night. And the devil teach me how to use my lie. The bank manager raised his glass to his lips, but I had forgotten mine. And the devil played up. Before I tasted my soup, I decided what to do. I had determined to rob that bank instead of going to bed and get back to Melbourne for breakfast, if the doctor's mare could do it. I would tell the doctor that I had missed my way and been bushed for hours, as I might easily have been, and never got to Ye at all. At Ye, on the other hand, the impersonation and robbery would ever after be attributed to a member of that gang that had waylaid and murdered the new manager with that very object. You're acquiring some experience in such matters, Bunny. I ask you, was there ever a better get-out? Last night's was something like that. Only never such a certainty. And I saw it from the beginning. Saw it to the end. Before I had finished my soup. is reading Raffles and will read a further episode tomorrow afternoon after the news at four. Richard. Seven minutes past four, you're listening to the Pyra program on LBC. It's time now for Robert Stevens to read the day's instalment of Raffles the Amateur Cracksman by Ernest Horning. A.J. Raffles has been telling his partner, Bunny, about his first foray into the world of crime. It happened on a cricketing tour of Australia when Raffles, flat broke from betting on the horses, heard that a relative had been appointed as manager of a small-town bank out in the bush. Hoping for a loan, Raffles set off to stay with W.F. Raffles and found himself mistaken as the bank's new manager on his arrival. He realised that the suspicious characters who he'd met on his journey were in fact bushwhackers who must have set about his kinsmen and delayed, perhaps permanently, his arrival. Raffles decided, in a moment's desperation, to carry on impersonating the manager and to use his position to gain access to the strong room and to rob the bank. When Raffles began his story of how he took his first step into crime, the sounds of Piccadilly came floating in through the open windows of his Albany apartment, but now the last wheels had rattled, the last brawler was removed, and his voice alone broke the quiet of the summer night as he continued his tale. So you see, he said, my plan was laid. I was going to rob the bank and ride hell for leather back to Melbourne before breakfast. To increase my chances, the cashier, who also lived in the bank, was away over the holidays. 
He'd actually gone to Melbourne to see us play cricket. And the man who had looked after my horse also waited at table. And he and his wife were the only servants, and they slept in a separate building. You may be sure I ascertained all this before we'd finished dinner. Indeed, I was by way of asking too many questions. The most oblique and delicate was that which elicited my host's name. Eubank. Or was I careful enough to conceal their drift? Do you know, said this fellow Eubank, who was one of the downright sort, if it wasn't you, I should say you were in a funk of robbers. Have you lost your nerve? Well, I hope not, I said, turning jolly hot, I can tell you. But, well, it's uh, not a pleasant thing to have to put a bullet through a fellow. No, he said coolly. I should rather enjoy nothing better myself. Besides, yours didn't go through. I wish it had. I was smart enough to cry. Amen, he said. And I emptied my glass. Actually, I did not know whether my wounded bank robber was in prison, dead or at large. But now that I had had more than enough of it, Eubank would come back to the subject. He admitted that the staff was small, but as for himself, he had a loaded revolver under his pillow all night, under the counter all day, and he was only waiting for his chance. Under the counter, eh? I was ass enough to say. Here, yeah, he said, surprised. So would you. He was looking at me in astonishment. Something told me to say, well, of course, I had forgotten. Would have been quite fatal considering what I was supposed to have done. So I looked down my nose and shook my head. Not under the counter, I said. But it's the regulation, he said. For the moment I felt stumped, though I trust I only looked more superior than before, and I think I justified my look. The regulation, I said at length, in the most offensive tone of my command, yes, the regulation would have us all dead men, my dear sir. Do you expect your bank robber to let you reach for your gun in the place where he knows it's kept? I had mine kept in my pocket, and I got my chance by retreating from the counter with all visible reluctance. Eubank stared at me with open eyes and a five-barred forehead. Then down came his fist on the table. By God, that was smart. Still, he added, like a man who would not be in the wrong. The papers said the other thing, you know. Of course, I rejoined, because they said what I told them. You wouldn't have me advertise the fact that I improved upon the bank's regulations, would you? So that cloud rolled over, and by Jove, it was a cloud with a golden lining, not silver. Real good Australian gold. For old Eubank hadn't quite appreciated me till then. He was a hard nut, a much older man than myself, and I felt pretty sure he thought me young for the place and supposed my feet a fluke. But I never saw a man change his mind more openly. He got out his best brandy. He made me throw away the cigar I was smoking and opened a fresh box. He was a convivial-looking party with a red moustache and a very humorous face. And from that moment, I laid myself out to attack him on his convivial flank. But he wasn't a Rubin Rosenthal. He had a treble-seamed, hand-sewn head and could have drunk me under the table ten times over. All right, I thought, you may go to bed sober, but you will sleep like a timber yard. And I threw half he gave me through the open window when he wasn't looking. He was a good chap, Eubank, and not at all intemperate. Convivial, I called him. And I only wish he had been something more. He did, however, become more genial as the evening advanced. And I had not much difficulty in getting him to show me around the bank at what was really an unearthly hour for such a proceeding. And I knew every inch of the business premises before I shook hands with you back in my room. You won't guess what I did with myself for the next hour. 
I undressed and went to bed. The incessant straying and even the most deliberate impersonation is the most wearing thing I know, but how much more so when the impersonation is impromptu. There's no uh, getting your eye in. The next word may bowl you out. It's batting in a bad light all through. I haven't told you of half the tight places I was in during a conversation that ran into hours and became dangerously intimate towards the end. You can imagine them for yourself. And then, picture me spread out on my bed, getting my second wind for the big deed of the night. Once more I was in luck, for I had not been lying there long before I heard my dear Eubanks snoring like a harmonium, and the music never ceased for a moment. It was as loud as ever when I crept out and closed my door behind me, and as regular as ever when I stopped to listen at his. And I have yet to hear the concert that I should enjoy much more. The good fellow snored me out of the bank and was still snoring when I stood and listened under his open window. Why did I leave the bank first? To catch and settle the mare and tether her in a clump of trees close by, to have the means of escape nice and handy before I went to work. And I have often wondered at the instinctive wisdom of that precaution. Unconsciously, I was acting on what has been one of my guiding principles ever since. Pains and patience were required. I had to get my saddle out without waking the man, and I was not used to catching horses in the horse paddock. Then I distrusted the poor old mare. So I went back to the stables for a hat full of oats which I left with her in the clump, half and all. There was a dog, too, to reckon with, the burglar's very worst enemy. But I had been astute enough to make immense friends with him during the evening, and he wagged his tail, not only when I came downstairs, but when I reappeared at the back door. As the so-called new manager, I had been able, in the most ordinary course, to pump poor Eubank about anything and everything connected with the working of the bank, especially in the last invaluable twenty minutes before turning in. I had made a very natural point of asking him where he kept and would recommend me to keep the keys at night. Of course, I thought he would take them with him to his rooms, but no such thing. He had a dodge worth two of that. What it was doesn't matter, but no outsider would have found those keys in a month of Sundays. I had them in a few seconds, and in a few more, I was in the strong room itself. The moon had risen and was letting quite a lot of light into the bank. I had brought a bit of candle with me from my room, and in the strong room, which was down some narrow stairs behind the counter in the banking house, I had no hesitation in lighting it. There was no window down there. And though I could no longer hear old Eubank snoring, I had not the slightest reason to anticipate disturbance from that quarter. I did think of locking myself in while I was at work, but thank goodness, the iron door had no keyhole on the inside. Well, there were heaps of gold in the safe, but I only took what I needed and could comfortably carry not much more than a couple of hundred altogether. Not a note would I touch. And my native caution came out also in the way I divided the sovereigns between all my pockets and packed them up so that I shouldn't be like the old woman of Banbury Cross with everything jingling. Well, you think me too cautious still, Bunny, but I was insanely cautious then. And it was that just as I was ready to go, whereas I might have been gone ten minutes earlier. There came a violent knocking on the outer door. Bunny, it was the outer door of the banking chamber. My candle must have been seen, and there I stood with the wax running hot over my fingers in that brick grave of a strong room. There was only one thing to be done. I must trust to the sound sleeping of Eubank upstairs, open the door myself, knock the visitor down, or shoot him with a revolver I had been smart enough to buy before leaving Melbourne and make a dash for that clump of trees in the doctor's mare. 
My mind was made up in an instant, and I was at the top of the stairs, the knocking still going on, when a second sound drove me back. It was the sound of bare feet coming along a corridor. My narrow stairs were stone. I tumbled down it with little noise, and had only to push open the iron door, for I had left the keys in the safe. As I did so, I heard a handle turn overhead, and thank God that I had shut every single door behind me. You see, old chap, one's caution doesn't always let one down. Who's that knocking? said Eubank up above. I couldn't make out the answer. It sounded to me like the supplication of a spent man. What I did here plainly was the cocking of a bank revolver before the bolts were shot back. Then a tottering step, a hard, short, shallow breathing, and Eubank's voice crying in horror. My God, good Lord, what's happened to you? You're bleeding like a pig. What's done it? Bush Rangers, came the reply. Down the road? asked Eubank. This and Whittlesea, tied to a tree, cop shot, left me to bleed to death. The weak voice failed, and the bare feet bolted. Now was my time if the poor devil had fainted, but I could not be sure. And there I crouched, down below in the dark, with the half-shut iron door, not less spellbound than imprisoned. He was just as well, for Eubank wasn't gone a minute. Drink this, I heard him say. And when the other spoke, his voice was stronger. <coughs> now I begin to feel alive. Don't talk, said Eubank. It does me good, said the voice. You don't know what it was like, all those miles alone, one an hour at the outside. I never thought I should come through. You must let me tell you, in case I don't. Will, have another sip. Thank you. I said bush rangers, of course. There are no such things nowadays. What were they, then? Bank thieves. The one that had the pot shots at me was the very brute I drove out of the bank at Coburg with a bullet in him. Raffles, I said. I knew it. Of course you did, Bunny, said Raffles. So did I. Down in that strong room, but old Eubank didn't. And I thought he was never going to speak again. You're delirious, he said at last. Who in the blazes do you think you are? The new manager, says the other. The new manager's in bed and asleep upstairs. When did he arrive? This evening. He said his name was Raffles. Well, I'm damned, whispered the real man. I thought it was just revenge, but now I know what it was. My dear sir, the man upstairs is an imposter, if he's upstairs still. He must be one of the gang. He's going to rob the bank, if he hasn't done so already. If he hasn't done so already, not a Jew bank. If he's upstairs still, by God, if he is, I'm sorry for him. His tone was quiet enough, but about the nastiest I ever heard, I tell you, Danny, I was glad I bought that revolver. It looked as though it would be mine against his, muzzle to muzzle. Better have a look down here first, said the new manager. Well, he gets out of the window. No, no, he's not down here, said Eubank. It's easy to have a look, said the other Raffles. Bunny, if you ask me what was the most thrilling moment of my infamous career, I say it was that moment. There I stood at the bottom of those narrow stone stairs inside the strong room with the door a good foot open. And I didn't know whether it would creak or not if I tried to close it. And the light was coming nearer, and I didn't know. I had to chance it. And it didn't creak a bit. 
It was far too solid and well hung, and it fitted so close that I felt the air squeeze out in my face. How I blessed that door. Now he's not down there, I heard Eubank say, as though through cotton wool. And in a few seconds, I ventured to open it once more and was in time to hear them creeping to my room. Well, now, there was not a fifth of a second to be lost. But I am proud to say that I came up those stairs on my toes and fingers and out of that bank just as gingerly as though my time had been my own. I didn't even forget to put on the hat that the doctor's mare was eating the oats out of. I didn't even gallop away, but just jogged off quietly in the thick dust at the side of the road. Though I own my heart was galloping, and thank my stars the bank was at that end of the township in which I really hadn't set foot. And the very last thing I heard were the two managers raising Kane and the coachman. And now, Banny, he stood up and stretched himself with a smile that ended in a yawn. But that's not all, I cried. Well, I'm sorry to say it is, said Raffles apologetically. The thing should have ended with an exciting chase, I know, but somehow it didn't. I suppose they thought I had got no end of a start. Then they had made up their minds that I belonged to the gang, which was not so many miles away, and one of them had got as much as he could carry from the gang as it was. But I wasn't to know all that, and I'm bound to say that there was plenty of excitement left for me. Lord, how I made that poor brute travel when I got among the trees. Though we came over fifty miles from Melbourne, we had done it at snail's pace. But those stolen oats had brisked the old girl up to such a pitch that she fairly bolted when she felt her nose turn south. By Jove, it was no joke. In and out of those trees and under branches, with your face buried in the mane. I told you about the forest of dead guns. It looked perfectly ghostly in the moonlight. And I found it as still as I had left it. So still that I pulled up there, my first halt, and lay with my ear to the ground for two or three minutes. But I heard nothing, not a thing, but the mare's bellow in my own heart. And did the mare carry you all the way back to Melbourne, I asked. Every rod, pole and perch, said Raffles. I had her well seen to at our hotel and returned her to the doctor in the evening. He was tremendously tickled to hear that I had been bushed. Next morning, he brought me the paper to show me what I'd escaped from. Without suspecting anything, Raffles, I said. Oh, said Raffles as he put out the gas. That's the point on which I've never made up my mind. The mare and her colour was a coincidence. Luckily, she was only a bay, and I fancied the condition of the beasts must have told a tale. But the doctor's manner was completely different. I'm inclined to think he suspected something, though not the right thing. I wasn't expecting him. And I fear my appearance may have increased his suspicions. Why? I asked. I used to have a rather heavy moustache, said Raffles. But I lost it. The day after I lost my innocence. Robert Stevens reads a further episode of Raffles tomorrow afternoon here on LBC.